Okay, everyone, we're going to pick up in Ezekiel uh, chapter 41, just a few verses before that, where we left off with Daniel's class on Wednesday. As uh, was mentioned, Daniel and Beth are traveling. Hope they have a safe trip back home. And since y'all didn't know that I was going to be speaking here and up front, if you want to leave now, I'll give you two minutes. There you go. I know Alex is going to be out of here. That's... Okay, um, this is... Uh, Interesting class uh, to me, uh, and all the details that are in there, and I've uh, included some things today that I, I hope are helpful for, for us as we discuss the context of what's going on in Ezekiel and the meaning of this particular vision that uh, Ezekiel is having here. So, have you guys seen these guys before? You've seen these? Okay. Yesterday, you saw? Okay. I am told that Secret Service agents can actually analyze micro expressions and they could tell the difference between all these guys, right? So I don't know. But I was thinking about this today, you know, getting ready for class. I said, you know, I, I was excited to be here. Kimber and I were, you know, looking forward to services. So we were excited and we were cheerful getting to be around our brethren. So all that was good. And we're happy. We're just happy to be Christians, to be amongst our brethren. And we're very proud of this congregation and what it stands for and its, its work here in the community. So all this was working out well. And then I was thinking, if we can get through all of that and get through this class without becoming that guy, we're going to be doing really good today. So bear with me as we get through Ezekiel and these two chapters in 41 and 42. So what we're going to cover today, no handouts today. Everything's on the slides. We will post these so that uh, you can look at them later. We're going to look at a, a brief timeline of the period that we're in right now. Uh, and make sure that we're kind of baselined in where these events are taking place. Quickly go over the last two classes. Then I thought we'd take a look at some of the contemporary prophecies that are taking place in this same time frame to the people while they're in captivity. We'll do a quick comparison of the temples through the ages. So maybe get into the mindset of what the Israelites were thinking when they thought temple. And then they heard Ezekiel's uh, prophecy and vision. How did it compare? Quick overview of what's in 41 and 42, and we'll do a quick attribute comparison between the different temples and uh, look at some applications for today. So here's our timeline. We're gonna start it off in the first captivity, which started in plus or minus 606 BC. Of course, that's the captivity where Daniel and some of the more senior uh, royal people were taken away to uh, Babylon in the first captivity, and it wraps up in 536 when the Israelites are allowed to come back under Cyrus when the Medo-Persian Empire took over. So building up that timeline, so a couple of things take place there. In 598 was the second captivity. This is where the book of uh, Ezekiel basically starts in reference to it being the fifth year of their captivity. And this is when just Hoya Chen and Ezekiel are taken there. And Ezekiel is called five years late, later in 593. Now going on, some of the main events that we've seen in the book so far, so we read all about Jerusalem being besieged and how bad that was for the people there. Very traumatic incidents, starvation, terrible conditions. That was in 598, and then the cities actually destroyed 18 months later in 586. Cities leveled, everything's gone. We read about that in Ezekiel uh, just a few weeks ago. Now, picking up today, we're a few years later, plus or minus uh, 13 years in 573, and this is where the vision of the temple takes place. Now remember, last week, Daniel uh, made uh, reference to the fact that this was 25 years after their captivity started, which was the second one, 598, and I think the numbers actually do work out to be exactly 25 years. And the reference to 25 years in the Jewish mind would have brought to mind, hey, we're halfway to the Jubilee because that was every 50 years. Now, not an exact analogy, but an approximate one is if you look at that timeline, this vision takes place about halfway from the start of the original captivity in 606 to 536. So at this point, they are roughly halfway through with their overall captivity. So maybe not an exact analogy, but it did kind of pop to mind that while they might be thinking halfway to Jubilee, it's actually at, uh, true as well of them being halfway through their overall captivity in Babylon. So when we look back at Ezekiel, we track from 598 basically to this time period as far as the revelation that we have to Ezekiel. He's in Babylon, remember, not in the capital, but down on the river Kibar uh, to the south of that. In parallel with this, though, we have two other prophets that we're going to look at today. Daniel 
was in Babylon as well, taken captive, as we said, in the first captivity, and his prophecies continue all the way to the return uh, to Jerusalem, or, or just before that in 536. Also in parallel with that is Jeremiah, who stayed behind in Jerusalem, and his uh, prophecies continued from, well, actually before 606, but definitely starting there, and then uh, right after Jerusalem was destroyed from Egypt. So that's the timeline we're looking at, and the, the key thing I wanted to get here is that we're basically halfway through the 70 years of captivity that Jeremiah had prophesied. That's where they are when this um, vision of the temple to Ezekiel is uh, given to him. So questions, comments? Kind of clear, hopefully. Okay. Quick review of what we've covered in the last two classes with, uh, with Daniel. So, first of all, when he gave the overview of chapters 40 to 48 and kind of putting this in context, remember that this overall vision is a direct answer to what had been told to them back in Ezekiel 8 through 11. So, remember back then, this is when the vision that uh, Ezekiel had then was God's glory left the temple, left Jerusalem, and was outside the city. So now, hey, guess what? It's coming back. Okay, so this is the answer to that prior prophecy saying, hey, it's going to happen that he's coming back. The glory of the Lord fills the new temple and the name of the temple will be called the Lord is there in the very last verse of the book. So that's a nice thought to have in context of these several chapters. The Lord, uh, remember that the temple that is described here was not built by Zerubbabel and the Jews when they came back, which I think is a very important point. So you would think if this was a, a design vision, if this was a design document to the Jews, I would think that Zerubbabel and the Jews would have built it according to that plan, but they didn't. So they took this as something else, which I think is in line with what we've been saying in the class. This has a spiritual application for us, not necessarily a physical one uh, verbatim, even though we have all these details, Zerubbabel didn't build that temple when he went back. So it is a symbolic description of God dwelling with his people. And it starts with the exiles coming back to Jerusalem and eventually culminates in Christ and the freedom that we have through him. So what Daniel reminded us that visions are intended to be not necessarily dissected and applied piece by piece, but to be imagined and applied in a broader context. And these symbols that we see have meaning and they typically apply to something else that we'll see in the Bible. <clears throat> And then as we're looking at this context, remember when we look at the Old Testament, and I think uh, Jordan, we emphasized this earlier this year, the Old Testament is there, the law is there, the teachings are there to bring us to Christ. It is the tutor to bring us to Christ. And so we need to keep that in mind as we're looking at all the Old Testament, specifically here in Ezekiel 40 through 48. So as we looked at chapter 40 in detail, we said again, this is the 25th year of their exile when it started in 598 on the 10th day of the first month. It's 14 years after Jerusalem has been destroyed. And again, their thought was, hey, we're halfway through the Jubilee time cycle there. It is a time of anticipation. If you were sitting there in Babylon, you've been there all this time, I'm sure you're fretting now. Now, some of them you would hope were aware of Jeremiah's prophecy, and he had clicked off 70 years from 606, starting with that, and so that would put it exactly at 536. But they may not have been remembering that. So they may be having more and more anxiety uh, over time as that builds up. But they're thinking about what's going to happen to the city. It's been destroyed. What happens to the land? And what happens to us as God's people? So th they're unsure about that. So to kind of give this vision of what's going to happen and how God's going to take care of the people, Ezekiel's taken to a very high mountain back in Israel, again, in the spirit. The image of the dry bones is gone, and so that desolation is behind us. And so we're looking at something new. And uh, we're talking again, as uh, Daniel pointed out, this is spiritual geography, not necessarily physical geography, as you look at what uh, Judah, how Judah was laid out. So he does have an angelic guide, which is kind of nice. Shows him around, takes him through this new temple, and the angel's doing the measuring. And remember that he's given a rod. Do anyone remember how tall the rod was? Yeah, exactly. You, you guys are good. So it was six cubits, but it was not the standard cubit. It was the, I've heard it called the royal cubit, or anyway, it's a longer cubit, about 21 inches instead of 18 inches. Bottom line, but that thing is five cubits tall, which puts us about seven and a half, eight feet. So Ezekiel's told to pay attention, you observe, 
You don't have to build anything, but you do have to declare what you see back to the children of Israel. So why use a temple complex with the children of Israel? Well, the big reason was they were very familiar with what a temple was and what it was all about and what it meant to them as, uh, as Jews. And so the idea of God dwelling with his people again and using that as the context would make sense. They could relate to that. And so they knew what the purpose of the temple was and why it was important to know that God's presence was with them and they could be dwelling with God. And I really like this part of what Daniel said as he related this back to creation, the creation events and then separation into order. The same kind of analogy can be seen here in this vision of the temple, that we have separation, the clean, the holy, from the common and the profane, and very uh, strong protections put in place to make sure that those two things never crossed anymore. And then you had order within the temple complex itself, about how the priests were going to be, where all the rooms were, where the Holy of Holies was. All of this was put in place as part of this vision. And a lot of ornamentation. We see a lot of palm trees, which if you go back to the original temple, that was there as well. In this case, we have uh, palm trees and carob that are going to show up. Okay, click. And one other thing. Who was going to be serving in the most holy places? The priests from which department? The Levites and they were from which heritage? Zadok, Zadok, however you want to say that. And why was Zadok picked in this particular case? They were the faithful ones during the time of David. And so as we're looking for the priesthood that's really going to take care of business and make sure that this holiness is allowed to continue and not to allow something profane in, I don't think at this point you'd want to hand it over to the Levites that had been in place, and we've seen in Ezekiel already all the idolatry that they let in, all the bad practices, letting people into the temple that shouldn't be there. So you're not going to turn it back over to those Levites. You're going to hand it to a part of that tribe that has shown themselves to be faithful. And so that's why the, uh, the tribe of Zadok was picked. Okay, now remember that all the rooms indicate the dwelling of God and his people together. That's what this is all about. And... Uh, Daniel brought up the, uh, the analogy for Steve. We can't make fun of Steve now, right? So uh, in my father's house or temple, there are many rooms, meaning abodes, translated mansions in the King James. So, of course, what did uh, Steve do? He led, I've got a mansion. Yeah, okay, I thought that was pretty funny, actually. Anyway, that's the quick review. So we're going to dive into the rest of the, uh, these three chapters, 41 and 42, right after this. I did want to go back and look at, again, some of the parallel prophecies taking place so that Israel as a whole, and this is taking place between the very small remnant left in Jerusalem, the ones that have been transported into the royal part up in the um, uh, key city of Babylon, in Babylon, and then in the river Kibar. So let's look to Daniel because as we saw in the timeline, he's parallel and throughout the timeline that we saw for Ezekiel teaching. So he's got a longer span, but do you remember some of the key teachings that Daniel had as he was teaching the children of Israel through the prophecies that he was given? Anything jumped to mind? First and foremost, he talked about a creature or a statue with four segments, four metals, gold, bronze, silver, and iron mixed with clay. Yep. So that was in chapter 2, and he's describing kingdoms to come, starting with Babylon as the head of gold and then going through uh, the different kingdoms that would be taking place. So he has some very strong uh, prophetic um, foretelling, if you will, of what's going to happen from a geopolitical point of view, if you will. And so he's representing there Babylon with the head of gold, Persia, the, uh, the body of silver, Greece, the bronze, and then Rome was the uh, feet of clay mixed with uh, silver or iron. Sorry. He also gives very detailed prophecies of what's going to happen with Persia and Greece over in chapters 10 and 11. It's incredible to compare his visions to what actually happened in history, and you can just line them up. It's it's incredibly uh, foretelling to what happened. And then the most important thing that we want to get across today. That's the physical side, the geopolitical side. But what's the end goal of going through all of this? And we find this out in chapter 2. God's going to set up an eternal kingdom in the days of the fourth kingdom, which was Rome. So again, remember, 
Ezekiel's telling the people this, and in parallel with that, Daniel's coming out with a message saying, here's what's happening with the nations over time, and the end game is this eternal kingdom that God's going to set up during the fourth kingdom, so a spiritual application. Uh, we go on to find out in Daniel chapter 4 that there was a very hard lesson for Nebuchadnezzar, and the overarching theme there is that God rules in the kingdoms of man. Not man, God does. And so if we think back a couple of chapters when Ezekiel was talking about uh, the kingdom of Magog and the ruler of Gog and all these uh, kingdoms that were going to be aligned with him, God was going to take care of them such that they weren't a threat to the Israelites. And so this is in another set of prophecies emphasizing that point that it's all under God's control. So you don't have to worry about what's taking place if you're serving God. God's going to take care of everything. And again, this is one of those key messages being given to the Israelites at this time. As he's wrapping up his time there, he is echoing the same thing that Ezekiel has said. He says in his prayer to God, upon thinking of the return back to um, Jerusalem, he says, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. Very strong language there, but he's recognizing how far off the ledge they've fallen, basically because they were not faithful. And that's the same thing Ezekiel was saying to the people. You were so far off, there's no way of coming back from this. You will be punished. And Daniel was recognizing that. And now he's looking at the prayer for basically uh, reconciliation and repentance, if you will, as they return back to Jerusalem. And then this is another key point that we want to drive out of Daniel. He's teaching the people that there's a coming Messiah called the Prince in chapter 9. And as part of this, he sees the ascension of the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days during the Fourth Kingdom. Again, that's during Rome's timeline. So that's roughly from where they are right now, 550 years later. But they, he was foretelling of this coming Son of Man being elevated to the Ancient of Days and given a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Very much aligned with chapter 2. So all this again to say that everything that you're hearing from Ezekiel is aligned with this in the sense that we have geopolitical um, considerations here. We have considerations of God looking after his people. And most importantly, there is a spiritual application coming up with the Son of Man being elevated to the Ancient of Days and the eternal kingdom that will be set up. Keep that in context if we're talking about this vision of the temple that's here and we're considering the spiritual applications of that. And as we said, it wasn't a physical map because Zerubbabel didn't build that temple. This has a spiritual application to us for what it's like to be dwelling with God. Okay. Here we go. Now, a little bit later, this is outside of our time frame for today's lesson, but right after this by about 30 years, uh, Daniel's going to say, hey, guess what? Jeremiah made that prophecy, and 70 years are about up, guys. And so he knows that it's about time to go back home, but that's a little bit after where we are today. But he is one of the ones that remembered precisely what Jeremiah had to say, that the 70 years were about to, to run out. So let's go back to Jerusalem and look at what Jeremiah was teaching. First of all, I found it interesting, as God is revealing his will to Jeremiah, he sent a letter to the exiles in Babylon and said, here's how you're supposed to live while you're in exile which was really interesting. He said, live in peace, buy, sell, trade, raise your families, pray for the peace of the city and the kingdom. He said, live your lives. And then it's going to work out well if you do that. But that was a specific letter through inspiration that Jeremiah sent to the exiles that would have been where uh, Ezekiel and Daniel were. Um, the other prophecies that Jeremiah makes is that after 70 years of captivity in Babylon, first of all, he's going to pun punish Babylon. So they are going to be punished even though they conquered Israel and tore down Jerusalem. And he's going to cause the Israelites to return to Jerusalem. That's the prophecy that Daniel was re referring to. He also said that God will establish a new covenant with Israel. So again, he's setting a spiritual context here in the midst of all this physical prophecy, uh, prophesying that's taking place. And he says in chapter 2, I will bring them back to this place. They shall dwell safely. So that's his promise to the people. And then finally, one verse there from Jeremiah 23. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. 
Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Who's that referring to? It's, it's a messianic prophecy, right? He's referring to the coming of Jesus. Now the reason I pick on this one is two reasons. Number one, it's the spiritual application again, not just physical. But also the phrase there, when will Judah be saved and when will they dwell safely? When the Messiah shows up. Okay, so we have specific prophecies in Daniel that we could have read from that predicted that sometime during the Grecian reign, sacrifice, uh, sacrificial worship would be stopped. And so it wasn't all going to be peaches and cream. In Israel, certain things were going to come up. But he says the time when you're going to dwell safely is when the Messiah shows up. And uh, that's, that's when all of this culminates. So I want to just highlight those to say here, here we have this teaching from Ezekiel, we've seen his prophecies have come to play exactly in terms of besieging Jerusalem and the fall of Jerusalem. And now he's talking about something that in our day, a lot of people have trouble interpreting and want to make it say something that maybe it doesn't. And so in the context of Daniel and Jeremiah, keep in mind that with Ezekiel 2, we have a spiritual component here, and that's what's being referred to by the prophecies of the temple. Questions? Um. When he says Judah and Israel will be saved, is he speaking of the, and, and that salvation and safety comes with the Messiah, is he speaking of the sons of Abraham under the new covenant, or is he speaking physically? Because we, we understand, of course, that uh, Rome destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, and they lived in 2,000 years of peril. Right. A great question, Brian. I, I think it's the spiritual version of Israel coming back together. And we can piece this with other prophecies that are, are talked about. There are prophecies that talk about the physical kingdom being okay, and they're going back. But then prophecies like that have the broader context of the spiritual Israel that would apply in the, the, the Messiah. So, good question. Any others? Because we're going to get into pictures next, and my terrible PowerPoint skills. Okay. Temple comparison. So again, the, the thought I had in putting this together was Ezekiel is going to see this vision and he's told you're going to relay this to the people. And so when he relays it to the people, what's in their head? How are they going to take that? How are they going to kind of assimilate that based on their history as Jews and more recently their lives in Jerusalem before they were taken into captivity? So I tried to put together some compilations here of what would have been in their mind. And so we go all the way back in their history to when they had a tabernacle. And granted, that's been a long time ago for them. So, uh, but they would remember that from their history. Now, how big was the tabernacle? So I tried to put some dimensions on this so we kind of frame this thing. And so the length you can see there was 45 feet, width 15, height 15. You can find that all back in, in Exodus in those chapters there. And then that outer court area was 150 by 75. So I can kind of frame that in my mind. So a, uh, a good uh, Big 12 quarterback could throw that 150 feet. I'm not sure an SEC quarterback could. They could probably hand off the ball first. Sorry, SEC guys. Um, but anyway, that's the length there that we've got. Now, okay, you guys from Kentucky, go, go easy on me here. <clears throat> you can get a feel for the length and the width there and the physical uh, tabernacle, if you will. And that's where, when God said his glory was shown, where did it show up? It was right there. When the Holy uh, of Holies was there and the high priest was allowed to go in, that's where it was. So that's the context. Now, fast forward four or 500 years or so, and we get to Solomon's temple. Here we go. So try to put some dimensions on this one as well, and it's going to be really interesting. So the temple is the, I guess I could use this, right? Does that work? Yeah, there we go. Here's the temple structure. Here's the walls around that whole area. And so you can see that the length is 90, width 30, height 45. How does that compare with the last one? This is quick math. I should have put it on one chart. Roughly double in all dimensions. So it's about twice as long, twice as wide, twice as high. Now the court area also was about twice as big as where it was with the tabernacle. So again, if I'm a Jew and I'm thinking of the temple, I say, okay, we had the tabernacle, it's about this big, and we had Solomon's temple that's been torn down, unfortunately, but uh, I remember it, and it was about this big. And then we get to Ezekiel's temple. We get to Ezekiel's temple, there we go. Now, here's how big it was. 
So again, we're going to find something that is about double the size in the vision of Solomon's temple. So you can see the length there of the temple, and that one is back there, 175 feet, which is roughly double the 90 feet that we had for Solomon's temple. And uh, we check the width here in a minute. We'll see it pop up on a follow-up slide. It's, again, roughly double that. So again, it's twice as big. And so things are growing geometrically. Tabernacle, Solomon's temple, and now Ezekiel's vision. So if I'm a Jew, I'm thinking, hey, things are getting bigger. Things are getting better. Must be made in Texas, right? My jokes are bad today. I'm really sorry about that. But the other thing to note here, and this is the one that really stood out to me, is the dimensions of the outer walls. Look how big that thing was. So that's 875 feet, and again, not even a big 12 quarterback could throw that far, but that's three football field links right there. So it's, a, it's long on each side, and it's a square. Some of the translations, and this is based on it reading 500 cubits long. Some of the translations say 500 rods long. And so remember back, we said that rod was actually uh, five cubits each, and that would make the dimensions a mile on each side, which would be huge. I've gone with the, uh, the version we've been using before, which has it as cubits. But regardless whether it's 900 feet or a mile, what's the main message? You get a lot more people in that court area than you did there, and certainly you couldn't come close to that. So again, the Jews are thinking, this is big. Picture I have in my mind is a bigger worship area where we have the Holy of Holies. I have more area for people to come in. There are more rooms all around this, as we'll see in just a minute. It is much bigger. And so I, I think they would be thinking something positive at this point. God's looking after us. As we're going to see, he's giving us a lot of detail into what's going into this. And he's also protecting us. Remember how high and thick those walls were, approximately 10 and a half feet tall, 10 and a half feet thick. And so God's effort here is to keep sin, common stuff, profane stuff out, keep holy righteousness uh, behavior inside this particular complex. Any thoughts or comments about this? Does this help give a picture? From the three slides, it just seems to be looking at it today, more permanent, more majesty, more like this isn't going anywhere. Whereas the first one was for traveling, it was built to tore down its structure and its temporal. But to, to, see a progr to me, I see a progression as well. Right. Uh, permanent and long lasting. Yeah, bring those thoughts up again in about three slides, okay? Okay. okay. I read the part wrong. That's all right. Okay, so again, I think in the mind of the Israelites, they're going to be thinking, woohoo, look at this, this sounds really good. But again, remember, Zerubbabel did not build this. Okay, so this was not meant to be described and built. But in their minds, if God is describing how I'm going to take care of my people, keep them safe, and preserve holiness, this is going to give a very vivid picture relative to where they've been before. Okay, so I ideally would have had one of those video home tour applications that we could have just walked through this and, and used our iPads, nowhere to be found. So I tried to do the next best thing and um, I was able to get this was the same, uh, Daniel had two diagrams and this was one of them as we described this. So this was more the 3D-ish view. And so what I've tried to do is highlight from uh, the latter part of 40 through 41 and 42, where these different things are that they were talking about. So as we wrap up chapter 40, we get the description of the court right outside of the temple, and that's that area that I'm pointing to there. It was 150 by 150 feet. I'm trying to translate everything over to feet and maybe miles if we need to instead of cubits. But okay, pretty good sized um, area right outside the court. You'll see the altar there right in the middle of that, and we describe the vestibule and doorpost as we go into the temple itself. So that's, that's where that sits. As we go into the next section of chapter 41, he describes the sanctuary, which is that blocked area that we're looking at there, and along with the doorposts, the entryways, and he says within that is where you're going to find the most holy place. So the, the priests are going to be entering through that front door into the sanctuary, and then through that into the most holy place. And that's where the sons of Zadok would be serving God in that particular area. 
Now, backing out a little bit, he talks about the side chambers there. And so we're pointing to that. It's hard to see in there, but it's actually a tiered structure on the side of the temples there. And he talks about it having three stories, and each story has 30 chambers to go along with it. So we've got a lot of rooms there for the priest and others to uh, become uh, either housing in or taking care of their duties there in these particular areas. Now, there's one on the side there, which is actually the south side. And then on the north side, you would have a reciprocal set of, of chambers over there. So if I'm doing my math right, three stories, 30 chambers per story, two sides, I think we get like 180 chambers. So it's a, a lot of chambers there to, to accommodate activity. Moving on, he describes that building to the back. The interesting thing about this complex is you'll see gates on the outer wall on the north side. I've marked that north, east, and south. And the same thing holds true for the temple. There are doorways from the north, east, and south. No entrance from the west. And you can see that blocked off by the building and then by the, the outer wall there. So it's secure from that side, and these are the only areas of entrance. Moving along, we get a better description of the size of the temple. And here's that 175 feet we talked about before as far as its, its length and 90 feet wide on the front. And we have lots of detailed descriptions in there about the wood paneling, uh, three stories of galleries inside of that, and here's where all the carvings of both the cherubim and the palm trees are there. And evidently the cherubims had the face of a man on one side and the face of a young lion on the other. And so you would have palm tree, cherubim, palm tree, and the cherubim in the middle is looking both directions. One, the man is looking at one palm tree and the lion is looking at the other. And this is carried out floor to ceiling, basically, on all the structures in there. Moving to the outer side next to the wall, these are the galleries and the chambers that are along the north, south, and east wall. So again, it's on that side, that side, and that side. Three stories tall for each one, and that walkway is about 18 feet that goes all the way around the, uh, the outer court there. And then back in the back corner, these are where the priests were to take care of business there. They're called the holy chambers. They were on both the north wall and then on the south wall opposite that. And this is where they were supposed to eat the holy offerings. And there was uh, text in there specifically that said, hey, look, do not go out those doors into the common area and leave your holy garments here. Don't take them out. So you leave your holy garments inside, change clothes, and then you go out this other door to go out in the common area, not into the holy area. So very specific descriptions of how they were going to handle the sacrifices and also their clothing to make sure that there was no intermingling of common and, and holy. So that was interesting reading there. Um, the other part here is where we get the description of the four walls. And again, using uh, the one uh, interpretation of that as being cubits, not rod lengths, but cubits, that's where we get to 875 feet on each particular wall. So that was a quick walkthrough. I was trying to summarize all that detailed information into you know, kind of walking through the different facilities because there's a lot of detail that you can digest, and especially the links and converting cubits to feet. But uh, hopefully that was helpful in terms of seeing how this lays out. At the end of the day, though, I just want to, I, I just hope that we can get a sense of the magnitude of this thing. I was trying to relate this into something that we would relate to, and I'm thinking, you know, Minute Maid Field, does that, you know, is that about this size, or the NRG, Astrodome? It's big. The thing is absolutely big. Um, and it's gonna house a lot of people, and it is for sure going to keep profane out, keep holiness in, and make sure that the focus on the sacrificial service is facilitated and maintained as God wants it. So, any questions about the physical side, Mike? The tabernacle and the temple, don't people will figure out how ignorant I am if you put that in my face. Uh, the tabernacle and the temple being rectangular, but these outer walls being square. That is a great question for Daniel when he gets back on this. <laughs> well, you know, it, I was thinking if you do it in a spiritual context, it almost seems like uh, since they are square, since it's a square that it would almost kind of equate to equality mm -hmm. as opposed to the chosen quote unquote people in the, uh, with the Israelites. When you get over to the spiritual side, 
it could be more equal than just a race of people. I, I don't know. Like I said, I'm weird, and I was just... I was just trying to think of what the symbolic was, or what the symbol was between those rectangular structures and the square structure. The one thing I would point to, Mike, is um, the square, of course, is order and it's consistency. And if you get inside the temple, a lot of that inside the temple is square structure as well. It's just stacked one on top of the other. And if you look at that outer court that we talked about there, that also is a square. So there's a lot of square configurations within this overall um, layout here. And as you get into the temple within that, there's further square layouts. So if, if, you, were, if you were equating the squareness to equality, then that's even down to the minute yeah. detail, not just the outer walls. Itself. Exactly. It, that's a good observation. Brian? Yeah, I, I, uh, I'll add my weird thinking to all this as well. but. Uh, uh, the temple, of course, was the dwelling place of God, ultimately in the uh, uh, tabernacle. And we see this thing getting larger and larger. And so uh, I see under the new covenant. That you mean? Oh, there we go. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> We get into the new covenant and we see that we are the temple, which in a sense is expanded the temple in the entire world individually and also being told that we're being built up into a house of God. We the individual stone, Jesus the chief cornerstone, and then and then ultimately you get into heaven, and the city of heaven is described as a square, right? If you want to get to that. But more than that, it says there is no uh, temple in heaven because the temple is God and Jesus, we're the house of God, needs to be the cornerstone. So you can see this going from that, that fabric structure into the more fabulous and then ultimately to the more square. And we remain the temple of God, the dwelling place of God. Right. I was told specifically by Daniel, no revelations references. So. <laughs> Mike, you may remember that, right? No, good points, but again, that, that <laughs> right, but you can see the, the image of the square is going to carry forward into this. There's more detail in that, and as Brian said, that carries forward to the vision and revelations that we'll see when we, we cover those chapters. So, uh, very quickly, I wanted to look at some of the attributes of four different areas. We started to touch on this last, um, last class, and so there are four different areas that we could think back where God was dwelling with his people, and that's the garden. It was the tabernacle, it was the temple, and now we have Ezekiel's vision of a temple. So as you think back to the garden, and some of this came up already, but what do you think about in the garden that sets it apart from what we're seeing with these tabernacles and temples? Why was it different, a different situation and a different configuration? Yes, Garden of Eden. Well, what was that? Correct. Right. Yeah, Brian? But the garden, there was, uh, there was no sin. It was pure and holy like heaven. So you've got a picture of heaven in the Garden of Eden. I think it's Brian's big booming voice. That's... <laughs> exactly. And those are uh, some of the things that I had thought about as well. So you think about this. It was a dwelling. There were no walls. It was this garden. Uh, but they didn't have walls. There were no sacrifices because there was no sin. And the only fence, if you will, was a command fence where God said, tend the garden and don't eat of that tree over there. Tree of, you know, the one. Not the tree of life. Good and evil. There we go. So that was the key things that I was thinking about there in the garden, but you move on to the tabernacle, which was after sin had come into the world, and it's going to be different. So Q. Albert, so here's some of his comments from just a few minutes ago. Temporal versus permanent bread and Lord's table. Exactly. What else? We have to make allowance for something now that sin's in the world. What was that something? Sacrifice, exactly. So as you're looking at the temple, it did allow God to dwell in the midst of his people in a certain place because remember that his glory followed 
the tabernacle as it was moving around and as it was placed in Israel. They did have, you know, uh, flimsy is one word, flexible walls so it could travel around. The sacrifice was in place now. Only the priest could get into the holy place and only the high priest could get into the most holy place once per year. So that's a big change from where we were in the garden where God was there continually with direct access to now only one man once a year gets to have this direct access to the most holy place. But it did allow God to dwell with his people. And we move on to Solomon's temple. There we go. How is this different? Instead of flimsy walls we have, yeah, we got a lot. We got a lot here. Is that first or second? Oh, good. Wow. Let's panic here for a second. Solid walls, very ornate. You can read the uh, uh, phrase opulent because of all the gold and the carvings and the wooden structures that are there. Um, and the other key thing is, even though it preserved the sacrifices from the tabernacle and it was a permanent structure, they did not keep it holy. And so over time, uncircumcised people were allowed in, maybe not voluntarily, but they were allowed in. And obviously, as we read in Ezekiel, idolatry was allowed into the temple, which was a desecrating move. So this was not kept holy. Shannon? I was going to say, that's the key of all of them. What, which part? Well, that's true. The garden for sure wasn't. And the uh, tabernacle up until the time of this, I, I guess, was, it did a pretty good job. But certainly in the time of Solomon's temple, it, it fell apart, right? And last but not least, so is it? Yes. So, so the tabernacle, God said, build this for me. I'm going to be with you. Solomon's temple was David and was like, no, nope, there's blood on your hands. Your son will. So, but it was man coming and saying, I'm going to build this for you. And he's like, I wasn't asking for it, but okay, here it is. And so I just, that point popped in my head just now. Right, and he designed it, right? God designed it. Yeah. He got the layout and everything. So same thing with Ezekiel's temple, and we'll just move quickly through this. So you can see God's planning and preparation. And again, if I'm a Jew, mid-500s in Babylon, and I hear this vision, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, that, that sounds pretty good. It, it, it's a bigger place, got more room for us. God's planned it out, and he's definitely keeping sin, common things away from us, which is good. Larger dimensions, more people, the separation from common and holy, all the walls are in place. Strong focus on sacrifice and making sure that that is going to be enabled and taking place uh, throughout. And then the higher standards, if you will, not that the Le Levitical priests didn't have a high standard. They did. They just didn't live up to it. So the standard now is the sons of Zadok who actually did live up to it. And so that's the standard that we're going to have going forward. So hopefully this is helpful to watch how this is progressing all the way from the Jewish history, history that they would think of from garden, tabernacle, Solomon's temple to where they are now. So I had a couple of application thoughts for us today just as we were wrapping up. So what makes up God's temple today? Us, as Christians, right? And you mentioned before the chief cornerstone is Christ. Okay, so we, we have this temple structure now that is spiritual for sure and made up as, of us as individuals. So in this temple construct, if we're comparing back to Ezekiel's temple, how do we protect ourselves from the common and profane? Say again. God's commandments, right? We, we keep them or we don't, right? Do we ever have to put up walls? Mike's already nodding. Keep up walls to keep sin out and keep holiness in? Has that ever happened? Maybe not physically, but symbolically. Has anyone had, ever had to sever ties with someone because you couldn't be around that person or persons without being unduly tempted or encouraged or drawn into activities you should not? Has that ever happened? Probably all of us at some point have had to cease a relationship because we were separating ourselves from what was going to be sin. So it, it can happen to us. And whether it happens physically within four walls or more mentally and from our actions, we do find cases where we have to protect ourselves from common and profane. Um, now, we got into this just a minute, and I, I won't go there because I'm going to say the word revelations, and Daniel will be mad at me. So... I, I won't do that yet, but we'll come back to that in just a few weeks of how the God's eternally abode 
for his people and how it differs from these prior temples as well. So I hope that was helpful in terms of getting a picture of how this progressed through the Jewish mind to get to this image of Ezekiel. Big place, secure place, God's going to take care of us. We can take comfort in that. And in about 35 years, they're going to get the opportunity under uh, Cyrus to go back and be God's people again in his land and have his providence watch over them again. So any questions as we wrap up, comments? Brian? I have one question about Sada. Because I've seen a progression of the, of the new temple to expand the temple, but also I've seen a, a movement away to the new priesthood. Obviously, I guess Zadok was of the top of Levi. Mm -hmm. But was Zadok of the house of Aaron? Aaron I think is the one where the, they serve in the temple and the tabernacle. I've seen a, a move away from the Chronicle. I'll go double check that. I think it's true, but I'll go double check that. But for sure, it was faithful versus not faithful. Right. Yeah. But thank you guys so much. Appreciate the comments. And Daniel and Beth are planning to be back on Wednesday. So.